I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we ask whether Russia is heading for a humiliating defeat. And this International Women's Day, we look into the role women are playing on the front line. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, I'm joined by leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting across Europe to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's day 13, and today I'm with the Telegraph's defence and security editor, Dominic Nichols, Francis Durnley, our assistant comment editor, and Verity Bowman from our foreign team. So can we just start with updates from the front lines? What are the most important military updates overnight and this morning? Dom Nichols. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. Um, so actually, it was it was reasonably quiet uh, yesterday and overnight. There were more strikes to the, uh, to the north of the, uh, the capital, Kiev, very little in the city, more strikes in the east around the cities of Kharkiv and Chernihiv. Again, civilians bearing the brunt there. Um, Ukrainians have, uh, they've continued their strikes against, uh, mainly against the uh, Russian logistic element, so fuel trucks and ammunition and so on and so forth, which has added to this yet another day of stymied forward movement from the Russians. They have made advances in, in some areas, particularly in the south, although this is mainly along, along the established routes. They've yet to really push off those routes and get around to the west to Odessa or um, completely seal off or, or rather to take the city of Mariupol on the coast. So they have made some progress and of course that comes uh, at, gr- at great cost to both sides, let's not forget. The other big news is, is that th- there's been another very senior Russian general killed, uh, Major General Vitaly Gerasimov, who was the chief of staff for the 41st Army. He was killed in Kharkiv. Now this is the second general killed in a week. Last week, we, would, we had reports that Andrei Sukovetsky had been killed by sniper fire um, north of Kiev as he'd gone forward. He and a number of senior officers had gone forward to try to, uh, in the words of a Western official, uh, quote, impose their personality um, on the situation, i.e. get things moving again. Now, in Kharkiv, there's not been such a push on the ground as in the, uh, in the capital. Uh, Russians have re- largely relied on staying outside the city and uh, using fires, artillery, missile, air, and so on to hit the city. So quite why uh, General Gerasimov was so far forward or how he was killed, the circumstances and location are not exactly known. It should be noted that although the same name, he is not related to uh, General Vitaly Gerasimov, who is the who's the head of the armed forces and the the architect of the Gerasimov doctrine, this, this modern Russian way of warfare, which blends military, political uh, disinformation, subversion, um, assassination, all the various d- different levers a state can pull on. Um, Russia has been thought of to be uh, in the exemplar of that. And Vitaly Gerasimov is supposed, supposedly the, the, the architect of it. But as I say, not related to the, to the guy, uh, Vitaly Gerasimov, killed today uh, or in the last 24 hours. Thank you, Dom. Um, Verity Bowman, I know you've been looking into the the death of this Russian general and you found some interesting things. Do you want to speak to that? Um, Yeah, so I think something that's really interesting about this death is that we have found it from a leaked conversation that Ukrainian officials have released. So this has actually come because Russia's encrypted service, messaging service, seems to be failing at the moment. And if that is the case, it's a pretty huge blow for Russia. Um, So what they use is a system called ERA. It's a crypto phone service, and it was introduced with this great fanfare tip to work in all conditions. Um, But in this leaked conversation, an FSB officer asks his boss if he can talk by the system, but he says it's not actually working. And I think the issue is that this system needs 3G or 4G to operate, but the Russians have actually kind of shot themselves in the foot by destroying a load of 3G masks. So the phone call was actually made using a local SIM card, which means it was able to be intercepted. Uh, thanks thanks very much, Verity. Could we just um, look at some of the other big news um, from today? We had an announcement from the uh, energy company Shell about their operations in Russia. Verity, could you speak to this? Um, yeah, so basically Shell is scrapping all of its purchases of Russian oil and gas. And this has been announced actually by a really big backlash that they had after they bought some Russian crude oil last week. They backtracked, said that they're really sorry and it wasn't the right decision. But 
in the reality they got this oil at a heavily discounted price and loads of other producers were already shunning it. They have said though that they will give all the profits from the remaining oil to a fund that will support Ukrainians. A couple of other things potentially to pick up on. Um, the, we think the refugee crisis now of people fleeing Ukraine is over 2 million people. Who wants to talk to this and, and what countries around are doing to help? Uh, Francis, we haven't heard from you yet. Would you like to come in on this? Yes, happy to. I mean, before I comment on that, just to underline the catastrophe of the Russian army losses that Dom and Verity were speaking to, to judge from the Ukrainian defence ministry's numbers, which, whilst perhaps not entirely accurate, are the most plausible numbers that we have, the Ukrainians have, 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 are killing around a thousand Russian soldiers every day. Now, that's 12,000 killed during the conflict so far. Just to put that into context, in Afghanistan, the USSR lost only, in inverted commas, 15,000 soldiers in nine years. And that was considered an unmitigated military disaster, which ultimately precipitated the collapse of the Soviet Union. So those are the kind of numbers that we're talking about um, in terms of the scale of this. Then if we look at munitions, if we look at just at the photographically verified tank losses for Russia, we're now at the sort of numbers of the total number of tanks that the British Army have. So it's an extraordinary amount of lost munitions here. And Verity speaks to um, an FSB source, um, which, which we seem to have access to. Of course, we have to take all of this with a pinch of salt in social media. This is a sort of another front line in this in this conflict but if we're to believe the sources that we're getting there's a fascinating document that was leaked in the last couple of days of a sort of extended analysis by an SS FSB officer and he compares the the or she the disaster of what's going on with 1905 when Russia uh, attempted to kick and I'm quoting here kick Japan in order to achieve a quick victory and turned our army into a state of total calamity and he compares, or she, our current position is like Germany in 1943-44. And that's our starting position in Ukraine. Now, if this source is believable, then this clearly speaks to the, just the scale of the disaster that, 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 that Russia is currently facing. But anyway, you asked about the refugee crisis. The numbers are now up to two million um, have, have fled Ukraine. And in terms of Britain, there's been some very negative headlines for the for the Home Secretary in the past 24 hours. There are sort of 500 or so people waiting at Calais who want to have access to the very generous scheme that the Prime Minister has, has offered for refugees. But they are burned with bureaucracy and paperwork and uh, it's causing numerous embarrassments um, of, of, of people being turned away and clearly this is another example of the government not getting ahead on an issue that was obviously coming down down the road as soon as the conflict started. The other thing of course that's relevant to this is the Home Office already feels that it's uh, burdened with, with numerous applications for political asylum by those in Hong Kong. We forget that this is also going on at the same time as this. And there are legitimate security concerns as well. Many people will remember the tragic events that took place in Paris in November 2015 when a terrorist attack took place there that killed um, well over 100 people. Some of the people who carried out those attacks had claimed to be refugees and had had essentially um, got into Europe that way. So there are legitimate security concerns here for the Home Office, but it's not a good look at the moment. And it currently appears very mean-spirited and, and and Priti Patel has, has been attacked in the House of Commons for just that reason. So sorry, a rather, a rather prolonged reaction there to your question, but hopefully that was, that was offering some context. No, quite a lot. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, Dom or Verity, do you want to come in to speak to the refugee crisis? Is, is there much more to say on this? Tangentially linked to the refugee crisis, I think it's worth noting that the, the civilian protests across Ukraine have continued. So there's images yesterday from Kherson, the, 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 the first city that supposedly has, has been um, taken over by, by Russia, of a huge number of, of civilians approaching Russian forces, chanting, waving Ukrainian flags. And they were met by, uh, so the Russian forces walked towards them and fired weapons in the air, which didn't disperse the crowds, didn't seem to scare them much at all, but was the first time we've seen weapons fired. I just hope it's not 
a sign of a degradation in these situations. We've seen a number of civilian protests physically standing in the way of tanks, um, kneeling down in the way of tanks. But no, as far as we can see, in those protests, there's been a huge number of civilians killed, of, of course, in this war. But in these instances, we haven't seen the Russian forces open fire on these protests. And uh, I just I just say keep an eye on that, because if that were to happen, then then that's a that's another very, very grim marker uh, in this war so far. Thank you, Dom. Verity, you spoke before we went live, you spoke a little bit about the developments in social media. And you were on this podcast a few days ago talking about how social media is working in, in this war. And you said you had some updates on that and how it's changed in the last few days. Do you want to talk us through them? Yeah, um, definitely. So we already know what goes viral directly affects the war and Rishan knows this. But what's happened is TikTok has suspended all live streaming and content posting in Russia that happened on Sunday. And um, Facebook has been blocked. Using Twitter's got a lot harder. So it's really difficult to get a picture of what's happening in Russia and sort of chatter about Ukrainian casualties, which is something we were looking for, because we're getting a lot of news about Russian casualties via social media. Um, but at the moment, the Ukrainian president seems to be winning the social media battle on, you know, displaying himself as this wonderful leader who will stand up his country, who is really likable to a lot of the public. And he's got a big um, response worldwide to how good he's, well, he's coming across. And today we actually saw him do that again. And he posed a very casual selfie type video of himself actually walking around Ukraine's presidential palace in Kyiv. And he's sort of proving here he's not afraid um, of the Russians as their troops head closer. And he's kind of like almost calling out Putin and saying, look, I'm here, I'm ready to go, I'm not leaving my people. And I just think it's very interesting how he's used social media to his advantage in order to do that. Francis, I don't know if you want to come in on this. I know you're, you're fascinated by this aspect. Yeah, so I think we've already spoken previously on this uh, on this podcast, David, about uh, the Russian mentality and how um, the propaganda machine works in that country. Obviously, the strategy of the West has been in the past week or so to appeal directly to the Russian people and the oligarchs who have returned to Russia and who now face serious sanctions. And we hope, of course, that this may precipitate some sort of decline in Putin's popularity or perhaps even him being ousted from power. We have a piece in the paper today from Cheryl Jacobs, who's written a really fascinating deep dive into what the Russians are seeing on their television screens. She speaks Russian and has really immersed herself in this. And it makes rather concerning reading because her thesis and argument is, is, is not to expect the ordinary Russians to, to oust Putin. She says that the narrative being spun in Russia is far more sophisticated than perhaps we realise here in the West. It plays to the deep grievances that the Russian people have, and there are signs that it's working. We've spoken before about the cultural inferiority that, that Russia have, this view that the West is out to destroy them and to threaten them with invasion or at the very least a sort of cultural imperialism which, which, which harms this sense of, of Russian nationhood. But they're also obsessed with a fear of neo-Nazis. I mean, many of us have been sort of rather confused why Putin keeps making these references to, to neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Um, and comparing Zelensky and his government to being drug-addled neo-Nazis. Well, this is because in, in recent years, he has attempted through the propaganda machine in Russia to conjure an image of the West as if it's moved very, very far to the right, that in a sense that we are f both in America and in, in Europe, that far-right uh, neo-Nazi leaders are effectively seizing power um, and so when he speaks to this language, he's effectively trying to to say that that uh, in some way they're with, that, that the Western powers are worse than worse than he is in terms of the leaders that they currently have. But the upshot of all this is that uh, the sanctions may not break the Russian spirit, that actually uh, it will appeal to this long-standing psychological propensity to think that the West is out to get them, and so that it could actually backfire and, and create a more of a spirit of Russian unity rather than less. So um, I would recommend that everybody read Cheryl's piece in, in the paper today and online, because it offers some very sobering reading and, and asks 
all of us, I think, to reflect on perhaps the rather naive view that we think that this could be the end of Putin, because certainly from her reading of, of a real deep dive on this and watching and listening to what the ordinary Russian people think, that, that this this may well be a conflict that, that goes on for a very long time and the only means to defeat Putin is militarily. Let's move on to the the question that's the headline of this podcast. We are almost two weeks into the Russia-Ukraine war and we've seen, I mean, every day, Dom, you come on this space and you tell us of, of more Russian losses. We can all see on social media tanks being knocked out, sort of, you know, videos of um, Russian planes downed over cities, that, that sort of thing. So, And Dom, I know you wrote a big read yesterday in The Telegraph on this question. So maybe you want to start with this. I mean, the question basically is... Is Russia heading for a humiliating military defeat? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of observers are saying that that Russia has has lost the war already strategically. I.e., if you think about the aims, you've got a number of aims as a as a leader, as a as a government. You've got a number of things you want to do. There's no other way of achieving them, so you decide to start killing people and uh, invading. That, and that and that's how you're going to do it. So if you dial this back to think, what are those original objectives that President Putin wanted from this? And they've they've not changed. Or in fact, they were slightly watered down yesterday, as as we heard. That he said that they could the war could be over in a moment if uh, if Ukraine change its constitution to, to be neutral and i.e. not never join NATO, recognize the eastern regions, Donetsk and Luhansk, and accept that Crimea has gone. Of course these are you know never never gonna be um, never gonna be acceptable to, to Ukraine. Or dropped was any mention of denazification. But those objectives are just are just fanciful and they are not going to be met by military means now unless Russian forces take over the entire country install a, a, a client government that is then acceptable to the people such that there's not a, a you know, decades-long insurgency, etc., etc. So we, we kind of see where this is going. So you could argue that, and I think you could argue strongly, that, that Russia has already lost the war strategically. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be, they're going to accept that at all. It doesn't mean that they're going to accept it soon. And it doesn't mean that even if they do come to an ignominious defeat, that, that they're going to go quietly. What's happened here is they've broken with decades of strategy. They've they've gone for a military first posture here. When they took Crimea in 2014 and and other bits and pieces they've done Georgia in 2008. They've kind of the military's been there but in the background or, or under the radar as we always used to say in the gray zone and, and what have you was hybrid warfare. But it's been other measures in the fore, politics, economics, misinformation so on and so forth the last thing they tried a, a sort of military first policy and everything else had to fall in line was Afghanistan and that didn't end well so they, they've kind of tried the same thing again here and I think it will end up in the same way but of course in Afghanistan they left a client state there which survived for a few years and then, and then collapsed uh, under the Taliban but at least they they sort of withdrew saying it was a it was a you know a tactical move or you know reassign the forces Afghanistan's done that's not going to be possible here so it, it's kind of it is zero sum. It, one side has to win, one side has to lose here, and that's n- that's never a good place for for a leader to be. They don't like that. They've gone to war with a certain set of set of aims and objectives, and if they're not going to be met, and you're faced with a humiliating defeat, very rare that anyone says, "Yeah, f- fair enough, let's sue for peace and and, uh, and negotiate." So the question now is, if that is going to be the case, and we've seen from the Russian ground forces really a very poor performance in the last couple of weeks so they've not they've not done well at all and it and it is humiliating but you back Putin into a corner he's shown that he has a much higher threshold for risk he will take risks he does not care about civilian lives or the lives of people in his army or anyone else any other forces so he he will accept much greater pain before he has to go to the negotiating table for example than we in the west would even conceive I think therefore if we try and push him into that corner to accept a total military defeat there's going to be a huge amount of pain before we ever get to that stage there's no guarantee that we'd ever get there anyway we talked right at the start of these um, these twitter spaces and podcasts about the nuclear threat um, and whilst it seemed utterly inconceivable to us I come back to the point that Putin has shown time and time again that he's prepared to take great risks because there, there might be um, a payoff for him so we, we need to be very careful about pushing this line of humiliation. I think that's clear for everybody to see. So we don't, we don't need to underline it. We will report it and we will let the, the readers see what is happening and we will report uh, what people say about that. But we don't need to be too overblown because we run the risk of 
making the situation even worse than it is already. And of course, I come back, it's, it's the civilians who are bearing the brunt of this. So we've got to be careful about how we, how we handle this, how we talk about this. Um, I was speaking this morning with Bob Seeley, an MP, uh, long-term Russia, Russia watcher, lived in Ukraine for a number of years. And he was saying that we have to find a ladder. There's this idea, you know, Putin's in a hole, so what do you do? Do you give him a ladder or a shovel? Do you give him a ladder to, to help him out or a shovel to just, just keep on going? Uh, and keeping on going is going to bring more death and destruction to, to a lot of people. So we, we need to try and find a way out of this. And it's very unlikely to be through total military defeat of the Russian um, of the Russian army and collapse in Moscow and then utter, utter chaos that we see over there. So we need wise minds to get around this and to see what what is happening and, and how to take this forward in a in a measured way and what is acceptable to um, Putin and what is acceptable to Ukraine. Is there, if there, if, is there any way that uh, they might, they, they could be enticed to um, to negotiate this is their territory, of course, they were invaded. But is there any way that, that they can negotiate in order to potentially take the world down from a very dangerous escalation? So I just I just offer those for thoughts. I have no, no particular answer at the moment, but I just, I just think the constant humiliation of the Russian army is not a sensible form of statecraft. I'm not suggesting we've seen that particularly at the moment. I mean, the, the comments last week from the US about uh, about you know, paying someone to, to assassinate Putin aside, we haven't really seen that sort of jingoistic tub thumping language from from any any serious uh, state capitals, and 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 I hope that continues basically. Francis, I think you wanted to say something. There. Just wanted to just comment on something that Dom just said there. I think that's absolutely right. We have to find a way. It's very uncomfortable, I think, when faced with such a, a moral stark conflicts such as this where it's so obvious who the aggressor is um we want to there to be a fundamental moral solution where we feel there is a total victory um but actually uh, to speaking to dom's point we have to be able to offer if the chances are that that putin will not be deposed which as i say is is unlikely we have to be able to find some sort of off-ramp which ensures that uh, that there isn't the danger of a nuclear war or an escalation um a further escalation of conflict in modern times sovereignty has become something that is increasingly precious um, and, and I would argue that, that the Russians are operating in a mentality more common in the 19th century where we're talking about spheres of influence and I think we may in order to, to have some sort of peace there may well be some sort of agreement that's that's made which uh, in, ensures that in the short term Ukraine is not able to or not allowed to sign up with NATO or something like that. If this conflict really, really does drag on, um, there may well be some sort of concession which we all in the West would feel very uncomfortable with for the betterment of peace. One thing I would just say, and I know that we've commented time and time again about uh, the, how there's very, very little room for optimism. One, one thing I would just say is this conflict has shown very, very clearly the challenges inherent in any kind of conflict on European soil. I mean, if it was hard enough before in the 20th century, it's now, you know, next to impossible with the kind of weapons that we have. And that's before you even talk about Russian military capabilities. So to offer one sort of glimmer of optimism, I would say that this past week has made the likelihood of a sort of World War Three type scenario very much less likely, because clearly the Russians aren't up to invading any other European countries, first of all. But also, I think it's showing China and it's showing other aggressive countries that that this is a very, very challenging and difficult thing to to do. And I think it may well have had some sort of, it's made a lot of leaders perhaps reflect around the world. I mean, who knows? I mean, I could be proven wrong again in a matter of days, but I think there's there's some possible room for optimism in that regard. But, but my goodness, it doesn't seem worth it when you're faced with such tragedy on a daily basis. Thanks, Francis. Can we get into the nitty gritty a little bit more, I think? Um, I have some questions from listeners. One asks about the, the reinforcement question that we see lots of, you know, videos and photos of Russian tanks knocked out and Russian armor knocked out. Um, are, are they able to replace it quickly? And what's the situation compared to Ukraine, where we know that Western countries are funneling arms and, and equipment to them? Is that a huge problem? And um, is this something that would worry the Russian high command? Tom? Um, I think it will certainly focus focus their minds, whether or not it will worry them, um, I don't know. So US officials said yesterday that the Russian forces that were stationed around Ukraine from Russia and Belarus uh, are now, they've been committed 100%. So, so give or take, 
a few tank units, what have you. Essentially, all those units, they, they assess it to be about 100, 110, 120 battalion tactical groups, as they're described, each one being you know, quite a few hundred people, uh, have been committed into Ukraine. Now, they've also said that, they, that I mean, we've all seen that they've, they've ground to a halt. They are through the second and third resupply, and they're now, they now need a, long, a much longer term resupply, replenishment, and so on and so forth. So, because of course, what Russia is doing is is moving from from fixed bases into uncharted territory, if you like. If you think about it from the Ukrainians' point of view, they're falling back. If they are ever having to withdraw, they're falling back on their own lines of communication. So they're always falling back to areas of supply, areas of succor, areas of peace, areas where they can fix the tanks, they can you know, the, the fighters can have a rest, and so on and so forth. So an, adv- an advancing army always has this problem of of lines of supply and lines of communications being extended. Um, and of course, the longer you extend these lines of communication, if they're cut behind you, 20 k's, 50 k's behind you, then you can only go as far as the tanks can drive with the fuel they've got in them. So uh, Russia's kind of met this problem with the with the issues of the ground that we've spoken about before, um, and also the the, the seeming inability um, of or very very poor linkages between all the different assets, the ground and the air, for example, they don't seem to be able to talk to each other particularly well. Um, so there's not been a lot of combined arms manoeuvre, as we as we call it in the West, but you know, working together as a team, essentially. So Russia has still, has still got a huge advantage in terms of numbers, uh, but we are seeing that numbers, numbers are, are not everything. If you're going down very linear routes, it doesn't take an awful lot to stop that convoy moving, and therefore you, all the numbers you've got aren't, aren't, aren't going to make that situation any better. So Russia still have a huge amount of forces. I've seen estimates that these might be anywhere from half to sort of two-thirds of, of the entire Russian army. Bear in mind there's a huge, a huge amount more to the Russian military forces, particularly the missile and rocket forces. So I'm just talking ground here. But in terms of the Russian army, they've committed a vast proportion of it to this to this fight, and it's not gone well. So I, I would suggest, I, I would imagine um, Valery Gerasimov, I say earlier, the, the head of the Russian armed forces, is now thinking, you know, is this, is this a fight or is this the fight? Do I want to use up the army on this? Or do I need to to start thinking about I need to keep something for a rainy day Who's, who knows what's coming next and do I want to have expended everything on this so Russia still got huge huge advantage in, in numbers but their lines of supply are, are not working for them and the ready resupply of very modern equipment from the west into Ukraine is very definitely a factor now Could I just push this ever so slightly further because we've got another question who quotes Professor Michael Clark, former head of the RUSI, saying that, quote, I think he said this in an interview on uh, LBC recently. uh, The quote is, the Russian army is thought to be a large modern military, but the bit that is large is not very modern. And the bit that is modern is not very large. And I was wondering if if anybody would like to expand on that. Um, Our questioner goes on and asks, you know, what is it in terms of training equipment that makes a soldier who's 18 years old in Russia not as good as, say, an 18-year-old who's part of the UK, who's part of the British Army. Um, Dom, I know with your experience, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, so my, Michael Clark, former Director General of RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, one of the world-leading um, defence and security think tanks based based here in London. Um, yeah, I mean, he knows his onions. And, and I think that's a... I didn't hear that quote, actually, but that, as, as very bright people can do, much brighter than me, they hit the nail on the head. Yeah, the bits that are large aren't particularly modern, uh, the bits that are modern aren't particularly large. Uh, yeah, that seems to be about right. I mean, a, a conscript army is is always going to be a, a different um, a different animal to to a volunteer army. Leadership in the in the Russian army, in particular, has has often been called into question. It's very it's a very harsh environment, as we understand it. And so, a large part about what makes uh, a person want to get up and put his or her life at risk, trying to do something, and then the moral code of take another life i mean a lot of that that personal morality is is very difficult to instill if you live in harsh conditions you're not treated well you don't get home much um you're not enjoying yourself so that sort of fighting spirit is um is not thought to be particularly strong in conscript armies and um and the russian army in particular is is known to have suffered from a few from a lot of issues that, that can be can be put down to that so yeah, have a lot of equipment, but if the men and women using it aren't aren't really up for the fight, then um, you know they will find a way 
out of that. We heard reports actually very early in the war of um, of some Russian units, some Russian soldiers putting holes in their own fuel tanks so they didn't have to advance. So they had to, um, so they were just um, held back or, or weren't able to keep up the advance. Fighting spirit is is huge. I'm going to massively misquote him, but there was this this quote ascribed to Napoleon that said um, the moral is to the physical as three is to one. Basically. You know, you can have all the shiny kit you like, but if you haven't got people willing and able to use it and to put themselves in harm's way, then um, it doesn't matter at all. Just, just very quickly, just to finish that point. So in terms of armour, the Russian T-14 Armata tank is thought to be uh, a very, very modern piece of equipment, a very good fighting vehicle. But they've got very few of them. We think maybe they've got um, in the low hundreds. And we've certainly not seen any of those on the battlefield so far. We're looking at T-72, T-80s, T-90s. And very broadly, you know, take the number as the year that they were kind of manufactured. Of course, they will have had sensors and weapons and optics and all sorts of other stuff added to them then but the the hulls that we're talking about were designed back in those in, the, in those days um so they're pretty old and automotively not really up to it in a very challenging scenario so yeah lots of lots of very old kit not very much new kit added to which you've got the people actually operating them and the, the fighting spirit point that i've just mentioned if I could just comment on something that Dom's just said there, I mean, he talks about the caliber of the of, of the Russian commanders. Napoleon also said that, well, he put a huge onus on that. And I think Wellington said about Napoleon that he was worth 40,000 men on the field, such was his his ability and, and ability to inspire as well his military strategy. This may be a rather elementary observation, but the Russian military is is very corrupt and inefficient. I mean, they, they, for, for for many years, it was very common for for soldiers to to steal and resell diesel um, that was being used in tanks. And the former minister, I think Sergikov, I've probably butchered his name there, but uh, he w- was a very much a reforming uh, minister of the armed forces in the Russian government. But he made himself by being a reformer, very unpopular, made a lot of powerful enemies and was ousted in 2012, losing all of his power and status. His successor is a very successful and cunning political operator. He's great at court politics and publicity and image. And he survived administration after administration as a result. But of course, in so doing, he is not good at re-reforming the Russian army, building efficiency and, 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 and having the ruthlessness in order to make a, an effective fighting force. So I think that we are seeing the stagnation over many, many years of, of innovation in the Russian army. And of course, it, that filters down from the very, very top of, of poor calibers of, of commanders to, to the ordinary foot soldier on the ground. If it's rotten at the top, the likelihood is it's going to be rotten at the bottom as well. Thanks, Francis. I guess there's one thing we haven't spoken about in, in this question of um, is the Russian army heading for a humiliating defeat? And that's the impact of the Ukrainian armed forces and um, the militia and the, the other organizations that are, that are manning the checkpoints and so on. Um, do we have a sense of how their war is going from the same sort of questions? I mean, are they losing more kit than they're being resupplied with? Uh, you know, we, 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 I, can, I imagine it, it does look like the morale is very high, but I remember reading something, I think it was the other day, that there were huge logjam issues with uh, resupplies and ammunition and that sort of thing coming in from the West. What can we say about the state of the Ukrainian army right now? Well, just think, one thing I was going to say, it's based on what Verity was saying really eloquently earlier about TikTok and the influence of social media, um, is, of course, that the that is something the Ukrainians have on their side against, uh, as, a, as opposed to the Russians. I don't know if she wants to, to, to comment on that, um, but I think that's an absolutely crucial element of this war, which we can which cannot be stressed enough. If you can imagine how different we would be perhaps feeling and thinking about this, were it not for us seeing the kind of footage that we've, that we've seen, hearing the kind of voices that we're hearing... I think it has a really, really big impact. Um, but as I say, I'm not following it as intimately as Verity is. Um, yeah, so we're seeing a lot of footage from the front lines that we really haven't seen before in any other conflict. And a lot of it is from the Ukrainian military themselves. We're seeing, you know, them filming themselves on the front line. And I think one of the most important things we're seeing is Ukrainian families themselves and shelling that is happening and We are just getting a really um, big insight into Ukraine that we haven't had before. Absolutely. I mean, it's something, if if listeners aren't aware, my job here at The Telegraph is social media. So it's something we are sort of looking at every single day. And it's, and Ferris's fantastic work on it does shine a light, I think, on on the the air wars and the propaganda wars um, that are happening at the same time. So I think we're coming towards the end of our time. So shall we just wrap, wrap up that question 
Um, just think about, I, I, I would like to hear a little bit about the, the Ukrainian army and the state, state it's in, because it, seem, it does seem like an important thing to consider if we're, if we're asking the question of whether the Russians will lose this war or not. Well, very briefly, I, th- I think it's worth saying that the Ukrainians are, are taking um, casualties and losing equipment as well, and they are um, they're being resupplied, we understand, with the anti-tank and anti-air Missiles, but in the in the big ticket items, the tanks and what have you, that that takes. I mean, that's impossible. That's that's not going to be resupplied from the west. They might be. They might be able to use some of the kit that they're taking off the Russians, but unlikely. Air force, they are being very uh, careful about what what air assets they have left. That they'd be very cagey about um, using those because they could be. Um, they are so valuable. And again, we come back to that forty mile long column north of north of Kiev. It's been there for for a week or so. Um, not been significantly. Uh, smashed up. Yeah, it's not. It's not really been used on that column, which is, probably says that, that, that they're really holding that back in reserve because it is so valuable. So yeah, I mean, and of course the other thing is that we we're just not seeing that. I mean, I am looking around a lot of a lot of places. I'm looking for as much information as I can, and Ukraine is winning the information battle at the moment. Russia, for all this talk of the St. Petersburg factory and the troll farms and all the rest of it, they are just not putting out the stuff on social media that we can verify to say, yep, that's another another Ukrainian unit been knocked out. That's another Ukrainian air, aircraft shot down. I mean, we're just not seeing this. So either they're not very good at it um, or there's just not as much evidence to show for it. Or perhaps they, they just don't have they don't have the the, the means of capturing all this evidence, you know, the iPhones and what have you, which would be sensible. I mean, you, you, you would expect to, to take for operational security. You, you would expect your troops not to be, not to carry iPhones with them and, and so on and so forth. So I do I do accept that as a uh, as a massive caveat. Ukraine is one of the few countries in the world which has made International Women's Day celebrated today, the 8th of March, a public holiday. Last year, women marched through the streets of Kyiv calling for gender equality. This year, the streets of the capital are a very different place. Telegraph journalist Elena Stiefel has been talking to the women of Kyiv. MPs who have traded parliament for the front line, journalists now helping to deliver weapons to the troops, mothers giving birth in bomb shelters. My colleague Sophie Coe sat down with Elena, who started by telling us what International Women's Day looked like in Kyiv in 2021. So obviously it was quite different. I mean, the streets of Kyiv must look completely different now to how they looked on March 8th last year. There was a peaceful march, women, you know, feminist activists. It was all about calling for gender equality, particularly during the pandemic and then beyond and looking at kind of the impact the pandemic had had on setting Ukrainian women back. But yeah, I hadn't realised until yesterday, I must admit that it's one of the few countries in the world that actually has it as a public holiday, which is extraordinary. But this year, it's for sure a very different place. And you've been speaking today to women whose lives have turned upside down in the last couple of weeks. Can you share some of the stories of the women that you spoke to? Yeah, so I think we have this idea perhaps that so many women and children have obviously left Ukraine in the past um, couple of weeks. You know, so many pictures and, and, and footage of, of women and their children crossing borders and getting on trains. And of course, there are a lot of women who have stayed behind. And they're involved in all sorts of things from active fighting to sort of more grassroots movements in terms of uh, distributing medical supplies, medicines, antiseptic, paracetamol, antibiotics, that sort of thing. And then also food, um, weapons. There are a lot of women who are helping just sort of move refugees around. So, for example, there's a woman called Kira Rudik, who's an MP in Ukraine, who I spoke to yesterday. And she was in the car on the way to the northwestern border of Kiev with um, a resistance group, as she described it, that she's sort of assembled over the past couple of weeks. And they were going to collect as many refugees as they possibly could from a suburb called Irpin, which had been attacked at the weekend. And uh, a number of civilians, including at least two children, it's believed, were killed when Russian mortar shells hit this bridge and it collapsed. And so there were all these people just on the outskirts of Kyiv who were trying to get into the centre of the city in order to be able to then leave again out of a different exit. So she was going to the edges of the city to go and get them. So there are a lot of women doing that kind of thing as well. And are these women people who might have been in the reserves before? I mean, obviously, Kira Ruddick there, you spoke about she's an MP. Or are they people who have switched their day-to-day lives completely? I think they're mainly people who have switched their lives completely. I mean, there was one woman I spoke to who is a social media manager in her normal life, and she's now helping to deliver equipment and weapons to the military. 
There was a woman called Nadia who used to work as a PR manager and she's delivering medical supplies. She's only 25, but along with her friends, she's got this real operation where they are reaching out to people all over Europe and getting medical supplies sent to Kiev. And then once they arrive in Kiev, they distribute them to whichever kind of volunteer groups need them most that day. And then I spoke to a really interesting woman called Alexandra, who's a human rights lawyer, and she's the head of something called the Centre for Civil Liberties in Kyiv. And she's been documenting war crimes since 2014, but obviously her job has got much more um, yeah. intense in the last couple of weeks. And so she takes testimonies of people who have kind of direct witness of the sort of shelling of civilians. So, you know, all day she's just basically hearing people's stories. And I talked to her about kind of her living situation. She shouldn't really want to explain why, but she's living separately from her husband at the moment, though they're both in Kyiv. And I asked her if that was difficult, and she just very simply said, war is difficult. And she just sounded absolutely exhausted and, yeah, really felt for her. But um, there are so many amazing women. A hundred percent. And, I mean, we've seen, obviously, as you mentioned, the photos of the women and children crossing the border... And the women that you've spoke to, most of them have stayed. I guess the ultimate question and the one of the most difficult questions would be what was their reasoning for staying rather than going to countries like Poland? Yeah, I think um, obviously it hugely depends. I think uh, a lot of the women that I spoke to didn't have children and therefore felt that given they didn't have children, they were trying to keep safe and that they were sort of young and fit, that they could stay. And that's the kind of thing I heard over and over again, was just, I could, so I did. There's a woman, for example, called Tina, who I spoke to, who, she's not necessarily particularly involved in a, in a resistance movement as such, but it's it's almost kind of soft resistance, because she just feels that, that if she stays, then it gives her soldiers something to be fighting for, because if they're just kind of protecting, you know, a city full of empty buildings, then you know, is is that worth it? So she feels she wants to stay to give them a purpose. And she's a writer and writing a book and just feels that she wants to be able to get on with her life and her work and not let the war get in the way too much. Although she did say that she had, on the first morning of the war, purchased a small knife in a local shop, just in case, which, yeah, I think she realised isn't necessarily going to be hugely helpful, but she nevertheless felt, well, I need to get something. So she bought herself a little, like, stationary knife. And then there are other women, of course, who are kind of preparing to actually take up arms, like Kira, who I mentioned before, who has a Kalashnikov and has been learning how to use it and has been doing training every day to try and, you know, prepare herself for if she were to need to, to fight. I read in your piece, which we will link to in the episode description, that Ukrainian women's magazines, too, are offering advice to women on how to kind of cut their nails to hold a weapon. Do you yes. think that's... magazines that's kind like of... L Ukraine and things like that, which the features that they would typically run, I suppose, just have naturally shifted in the last couple of weeks. So one of the ones on L Ukraine, I think it is at the moment, is all about how to register a baby in the midst of a war. And obviously we've seen all those amazing pictures of women who have had to give birth in bomb shelters and underground, which is just, you know, extraordinary. Um... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of, I suppose, trying to offer what, what help and advice they can. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine coverage, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first month free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio or have it delivered straight to your inbox when you sign up to Dispatches, our daily Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from the front line from our award-winning foreign correspondents. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter to see what we're up to. If you found this show useful, follow Ukraine The Latest on your podcast app. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Theodora Ludludis and Louisa Wells. And on Twitter, Sophie Coe.